At 10.30 a.m. on St. Valentine's Day, Thursday, February 14, 1929, two men wearing police uniforms and another two wearing suits, ties, overcoats, and hats walked into a garage at 2122 North Clark Street in the Lincoln Park neighborhood of Chicago's north side. These men would murder seven men using weapons that included two Thompson submachine guns. Witnesses then saw the men in police uniforms leading other men at gunpoint out of the garage after the shooting. Hello, and welcome back. Before we begin, don't forget to subscribe to the Past Crimes channel and hit that notification bell. The North Side Gang, like many other Chicago-based prohibition gangs, arose from the Market Street Gang, one of many street gangs in Chicago at the turn of the 20th century. Pickpockets, sneak thieves, and labor sluggers made up the Market Street Gang, which operated in the 42nd and 43rd wards. The gang rose to prominence during the early 1910s Chicago circulation wars between the Chicago Examiner and the Chicago Tribune. Future North Side leader Charles Dean O'Banion, then a member of the juvenile satellite Little Hellions, made valuable contacts with politicians and journalists during the circulation wars. Safecracker Charlie the Oxriser would mentor O'Banion and the other North Siders. O'Banion was one of many market streeters who turned to bootlegging. When Prohibition began, the North Siders quickly took control of the existing breweries and distilleries on Chicago's North Side. This gave them a near monopoly on the local supply of genuine beer and high-quality whiskey, while their competitors only had rockgut liquor and moonshine. The North Side gang would soon control the working-class neighborhoods of the 42nd and 43rd wards. Aside from bootlegging, the gang continued to break into local stores and warehouses and run illegal gambling operations. However, unlike the rival Chicago outfit, they refused to engage in prostitution. O'Banion bolstered his political standing by assisting his politician friends in engaging in election fraud. He also ran a public relations campaign in the North Side, donating large sums to orphanages and charities, as well as providing food and loans to the poor and unemployed. The old animosity between Irish and Italian gangs, combined with O'Banion's refusal to sell portions of North Side distilleries to South Siders, heightened tensions between the two sides. Mike Merlo brokered an alliance between O'Banion, Johnny Torrio, and Al Capone in early 1924. However, the alliance began to unravel when O'Banion demanded that Angelo Jenna pay a $30,000 gambling debt incurred as a result of losses at the Cone Gambling Casino, the ship. This demand violated an agreement that allowed Angelo and other gang members to incur debts there. Torrio persuaded Jenna to pay his gambling debt in order to keep the peace. Torrio would lose patience when O'Banion offered to sell him the valuable Zeban Brewery, then arrange for the police to raid and arrest Torrio while inspecting the property. Torrio then complied with the Jenna crime family's demand to kill O'Banion after being released from custody. On November 10th, shortly after Merlo's death, Frankie Yale, John Scalise, and Albert Anselmi allegedly entered O'Banion's Schofield flower shop and shot him dead. The North Side Gang would go on to wage a five-year gang war against Johnny Torrio's Chicago outfit. <sighs> Following O'Banion's death, Jaime Weiss assumed leadership of the North Side Gang and immediately retaliated against his opponents. Weiss, Bugs Moran, and Vincent Drucci attempted to assassinate Torrio's lieutenant, Al Capone, on January 12, 1925, in a Chicago South Side restaurant. The men shot at Capone's car, wounding chauffeur Sylvester Barton but missing Capone entirely. Unnerved by the shooting, Capone ordered the construction of his famous armored car. Morin then decided to kidnap one of Capone's trusted bodyguards, torture him for information, and then execute him and dispose of his body. 
Weiss, Moran, and Drecci ambushed Torrio as he returned from shopping with his wife on January 24th, shortly after the assassination attempt on Capone. Torrio and his chauffeur, Robert Barton, were both wounded multiple times. The gun misfired as Moran was about to kill Torrio, forcing the gang members to flee the scene as police arrived. Torrio decided he wanted out after narrowly surviving this attack. Torrio retired to Italy after serving time on bootlegging charges, handing over leadership of the Chicago outfit to Al Capone. Weiss and the Northsiders then went after the Jenna brothers. Morin shot and killed Angelo Jenna after a car chase. Following that, Mike Jenna was killed by police after turning his gun on them following a shootout with the Northsiders. Then Drecci assassinated Samuzzo Amatuna, a Jenna family supporter. Antonio the Gentleman Jenna was finally assassinated, although it was rumored that Capone, not Weiss, ordered this. The remaining Jenna brothers fled Chicago at this point. With the Jenna family gone, Torrio scared out of the rackets, and Capone on the defensive, the Northsiders expanded their business and strength and plotted another attack on Capone. A fleet of Northside cars led by Moran drove to Capone's hotel in Cicero in the second Northside attack on him. The Northsiders drove by the lobby and opened fire with their Thompson submachine guns while Capone and his bodyguard were drinking downstairs. Capone and his bodyguard were forced to seek refuge on the ground floor. After the attack, Capone informed the Northsiders that he desired a truce. A truce was reached, which inevitably fell apart. Capone retaliated against the Northsiders by assassinating Hemi Weiss and several of his associates. Drecci and Morin were now co-leaders of the Northside gang. For several months, the two gangs traded killings and bombings until a peace conference was held. During the conference, Capone complained that we were making a shooting gallery of a great business. He also stated that Chicago should be seen as a pie and each gang gets a slice of the pie. The two gangs agreed to reconcile. During this time, Drecci was killed in a police brawl and Morin now became the sole leader of the North Side Gang. It would not be long before the conflict started again. Morin had two union leaders executed because they were powerful allies and personal friends of Al Capone. Capone was prompted by this act to carry out what was to be known as the St. Valentine's Day Massacre. Frank Gusenberg, the only survivor, died hours later at a nearby Chicago hospital after refusing to name his assailants. However, the gunman's primary target, Northside gang leader Bugs Moran, was not at the garage and escaped unharmed. The identities of the four gunmen remain unknown to this day. The attack effectively ended the five-year gang war between Al Capone and Bugs Moran. The sheer gall of this crime prompted a federal crackdown on all gang activity in Chicago, ultimately leading to the downfall of both Moran and Capone.